Okay, so let's start this webinar now. Hello guys, good morning and welcome you all in this DP100 session. Myself, Archie Disset, I'm your host for this session. Guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We will be there to help you out. Let's moving ahead and talking about our event sponsor that is Synergetics. So Synergetics is an India one of kind co-porting learning solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question, we bruise through our offering and also give comprehensive advisory service to clients who wish to modernize their framework. We educate, advise, implement and manage. Then the Synergetics solution offering that is Persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add on solution, certification solution, certification add on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, crowd adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre sale training solution, tactics playbook solution, and architecting solution. Then what this Microsoft certification does, it will give you complete learning experience. You will get trained and appear for the exam and get certified. This is skilling journey here you can advance yourself. First you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced rule based certification and expert level certification. In fundamental certification, we are providing you AJ 900, AI 900, DP 900, PL 900 and SC 900. In associate level certification, we are providing you many types of certification. Here you can see on my screen. In expert level certification, we are providing you AJ305, SC100, PL600, and AJ400. Also, guys, we have special certification that is AJ120, AJ140, and AJ220. If you want any certification, you can connect with us. And certification offering. So certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on, onboarding, on like short duration modules and more. Moving ahead, today training is organized and handled by the ATC community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various uh, emerging technology. Under ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Then Azure Tech Community for Pune Kars. Then Emerging Technology Community for Surat Kars. Azure Tech Community for Nagpur Kars. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app and you can follow our communities there. Then you have to follow Code of Conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note, participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. So today's speaker for this training, Smith Shah. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently work with Synergetics as a trainer consultant. So agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about the topic and benefit of it. In this session, we are providing you DP 100 uh, complimentary learning achievement badge. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated badge. Make sure guys you follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for upcoming relevant updates. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic our speaker. She, uh, he will continue ahead. All right. Thank you, Archie. So good morning, everyone. And welcome to this session on DP100. So guys, DP100 certification is all about how you can make machine learning models on the Azure platform. I repeat, DP100 certification is about how you can make machine learning models on Azure. And uh, before we go ahead and talk more about it, let me just give a brief introduction about myself. My name is Mitch Shah, and I will be your mentor for today's session. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. On top of that, I'm a Microsoft certified a data scientist, a Microsoft certified data engineer, a Microsoft certified machine learning engineer, and a Microsoft certified AI engineer. So I've been in the data science training field since the past six years, wherein I've delivered training to many international as well as 
domestic clients including LTI Mandri, Walmart, Deloitte, Capgemini, and many, many more. In total, I would have trained more than 12,000 data science professionals up, up, up till now. So that's just a brief introduction about me. Now let's dive into our lecture for today. So as I mentioned, today's lecture is all about TP100 certification exam. Remember in this certification exam, you will be asked how you can make machine learning models on the Azure platform. So let's start with the basics first. Let's start by understanding what is machine learning. So if at all someone asks you what is machine learning, what are you going to say? So guys, machine learning is nothing but a set of tools that is used for two purposes. I repeat, machine learning is nothing but a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First purpose is to get inferences from data. You can understand inference as insights. Okay, so first purpose is to get insights from data or inferences from data. Second purpose is to get predictions from data. So let's suppose I want to predict something about the future. Let's assume that I have data uh, of rainfall up till the year 2023. Based on that, I want to predict how it will rain in the year 2024. So that's an example of prediction. Okay, so if anybody asks you the definition of machine learning, you will say that machine learning is nothing but a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First purpose is to get inferences from data. Second purpose is to get predictions from data. Now, how do we do that? How do we get inferences and predictions from data? We do that by using something called a machine learning model. I repeat, we do that by using something called a machine learning model. What is a machine learning model? It is nothing but a statistical representation of a real world process. Okay. What is a machine learning model? It's a statistical representation of a real world process. Now, this is a very complex sentence that I've written over here. Let's understand this complex sentence with the help of an example. So, suppose I have housing related data, I have surveyed some of the houses in my locality, and I have obtained their data, I have obtained their information. So let's say I have information about the houses uh, over here and uh, the first information that I have is I have information about the area of the house in square feet and next I have information about the price of the house. So let's assume that the first house that I surveyed had an area of 100 square feet and the price of the house was 1 crore. The second house that I surveyed had an area of 200 square feet and the price of the house was 2 crore. The third house that I surveyed had an area of 300 square feet and let us assume the price of the house was 3 crore. Now I have a question for each and every one of you. Let's suppose we have a fourth house in our locality. The area of that fourth house is 400 square feet. Now I want you guys to predict the price of this fourth house. Can anyone give me a rough prediction for the price of the fourth house over here? According to you, what will be the price of the fourth house? Anyone with the prediction? So over here, Bhavesh has given the answer. Even Mohammed and Pranav have given the answer. So you guys are saying that according to you, the price of the fourth house, or you have predicted the price of the fourth house, I should say. And according to you, as per your prediction, the price of the fourth house will be four crore. Fine. So Bhavesh, here you have arrived at a prediction, correct? So Bhavesh, can I say in order to arrive at this prediction, you use some mathematics in your head or in other words, you use some statistics in your head. Can I say that Bhavesh and other people who gave the answer that in order to arrive at this prediction, did you use some mathematics in your head, right? You did use it. So that's exactly what a machine learning model does. So just like Bhavesh, you, Mohammed, Pranav and Manoj, did you use some mathematics in your head, right? Did you use some statistics in your head? That is the same thing that is done by the machine learning model. A machine learning model also tries to use mathematics or tries to use statistics to predict what will happen in the real world. So just like you, Bhavesh, and uh, other students in the chat tried to predict what would have what would have been the real price of the house. 
by using mathematics or by using statistics. That's exactly what a machine learning model does. Machine learning model, so a machine learning model also tries to use some mathematics or tries to use some statistics to simulate what would happen in the real world. So up till now, we have looked into two definitions already. The first definition was related to machine learning. So we tried to understand what is machine learning. We said machine learning is nothing but a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First purpose is to get inferences from data. Second purpose is to get predictions from data. After that, we try to understand how do we get inferences and predictions from data? Well, we do that by using something called a machine learning model. What is a machine learning model? It is a statistical representation of a real world process. In simple words, we are trying to simulate a real world process using some statistics or using some mathematics. Now, let's move forward. Remember that before making any machine learning model, there are two important notes that you need to remember. The first note that you need to remember is that in order to create any machine learning model, we need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. OK, so in order to make a machine learning model, we need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. Now, the second note that you need to remember is that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. I repeat, the second note says that columns in the data will be of one of the two types. The first type of column will be called a feature column. Second type will be called target column. Now, what is the difference between a feature column and a target column? Let's understand. So guys, a feature column is a column that helps me to predict. I repeat, a feature column is a column that helps me to predict. On the other hand, a target column is a column that I want to predict. So let's suppose I have housing related data and I want to predict price. So can you guys tell me if I want to predict on the price column, uh, then price column will be called feature column or target column guys. Remember feature column is a column that helps me to predict. Whereas a target column is a column that I want to predict. So if I want to predict price, then price will be called which type of column? If I want to predict price, then price will be called which type of column? As Vaibhav, Pranav and Manoj have mentioned in the chat that if I want to predict on price column, then price will be my target column. Okay. Then Manoj, does square feet information help me to predict price? Manoj, does square feet information help me to predict price? Does it? Yes, right. It does help you. Similarly, does city information also help you to predict price? Yes, because in different different cities, the rates of the houses will be different. In a city like Mumbai, the rate of the house would be different. In a city like Bhopal, the rate of the house would be different, right? Okay. So as uh, you guys mentioned in the chat, square feet helps you to predict the price. City helps you to predict price. So any column that helps me to predict, okay, any column that helps me to predict, will be called my feature column. So your square feet column is help me, helping me to predict price. So it will be called my feature column. City column is helping me to predict price. So it will be called my feature column. Okay. So remember these two notes before making any machine learning model. First note is that in order to create any machine learning model, we need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. Now the columns in the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. Feature columns are those columns that help me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. So if I want to predict price, then price will be my target column. And since square feet and city help me to predict price, they will be called my feature columns. Now, moving ahead, if at all, if anybody has any doubt, do let me know those doubts in the chat. I'll try to answer it as much as possible. Okay. Right, moving forward now. Now let's focus on the different types of machine learning models. We know what a machine learning model is, and we know that in order to create a machine learning model, which two nodes to remember. Now let's focus on the different types of machine learning models. So remember, there are many, many types of machine learning models. Okay, there are many, many types of machine learning models. Okay, after every six months, a new type comes into the market. But remember, 
95% of the work done in the industry is done on these two types only. So today we'll focus on these two types only. Okay. But remember, there are many, many types of machine learning models. After every six months, a new type is launched into the market. Okay. But 95% of the work done in the machine learning industry is done on these two types only. So today we'll focus on these two types only. The first type is called supervised learning models. The second type is called unsupervised learning models. What is the difference between the two? Well, a supervised learning model is a model wherein the data that I am using has features and target both. I repeat, a supervised learning model is a model wherein the data that I am using has features and target both. On the other hand, a unsupervised learning model is a model wherein the data that I am using only has features, but it does not have target. Okay. So remember, a supervised learning model is a model wherein the data that I am using has features and target both, whereas unsupervised learning model is a model wherein the data that I am using only has features, it does not have target. Now, supervised learning models are further divided into two types. First is classification model. Second is regression model. What is the difference between the two? Well, in case of a classification model, the data that I am using, in that data, the target column has finite set of possibilities. Whereas in a regression model, the data that I am using, in that data, the target column has infinite set of possibilities. Now let's understand the difference between classification model and a regression model with the help of an example. So suppose I have some data with me, and in that data, I have a target column called dice roll. Okay. In that data, I have this target column over here called dice roll. Okay. There are other columns as well, but currently I'm only focusing on target column. So let's say in the data that I have with me, there is a target column called dice roll. And what I'm doing is whenever I'm playing a game of dice with my friends, whatever value I get after rolling the dice, that value I'm storing it in this column. So let's say when I roll the dice for the first time, I get the value three. Again, when I roll the dice, I get the value one. Again, when I roll the dice, I get the value six and so on. So now I have a question for you. When I roll a dice, how many different possibilities do I have? When I roll a dice, how many different possibilities do I have? As Bhavesh and Vaibhava are mentioning, we have six possibilities, right? As far as dice roll is concerned, we have six possibilities. So can I say, Bhavesh, Vaibho, and uh, Binesh, that since you have mentioned that in dice roll, we have six possibilities. So can I say in dice roll, we have finite set of possibilities? Can I say that? Yes, that in dice possibilities. So if dice roll column was my target column, and if in my target column, I have finite set of possibilities, then my model will be called a classification model. Okay. So if in my target column, I have finite set of possibilities, then my model will be called a classification model. Let's take another example. Suppose I have a target column with me. I have some data in which I have a target column called gender. And here what I'm doing is I'm storing the gender value of every participant in this lecture today. So let's say the first participant that entered in today's session had a gender of male. After that, the second participant that entered in today's session also had a gender of male. The third participant that entered in today's session had a gender of female and so on. So suppose I have this column over here called gender, which is my target column. Now I have a question. As far as gender is concerned, so how many different possibilities do we have in gender? So every participant in this lecture Okay, if I want to focus on their agenda, how many different possibilities will I have? Two, right? As Vaibhav mentions two, either the gender of a person will be male or the gender of a person will be female. So that means you are saying that gender has finite set of possibilities. And if gender is your target column, and if in your target column, you have finite set of possibilities, then your model will be called a classification. Remember that. Okay, fine. Now, let me take one more example. Suppose I have some data with me and in that data, I have a target column called
called temperature. Okay. And what I'm doing is every day I'm storing the temperature of my city. So let's say first day when I recorded the temperature of my city, it was 30.1 degrees Celsius. Then after that, on the second day, it was 29.879 degrees Celsius. Then on the third day, it was 29.9 degrees Celsius and so on. So let's assume that this column called temperature is my target column. Now you tell me guys, as far as temperature is concerned, how many different possibilities do we have in temperature? Finite or infinite? How many different possibilities do we have? Finite or infinite? What do you think, Vaibhav? So Vaibhav and Manoj have mentioned that as far as temperature is concerned, I have infinite set of possibilities, right? My temperature could be anything. It could be 25.678 degrees Celsius. It could be 26.9876 degrees Celsius. It could be anything. So as far as temperature is concerned, I have infinite set of possibilities. And if temperature was my target column, and if in my target column, I have infinite set of possibilities, then my model will be called a regression model. Remember that. Well, fine. So just to revise, we are talking about the different types of machine learning models. Remember, there are many different types of machine learning models. However, we are only going to focus on two types for today. First is supervised learning model. Second is unsupervised learning model. As one of the student has mentioned, I guess JKS has mentioned in the chat. Okay. He has mentioned that there are other types also. But as I mentioned, we are not going to focus on those for today. Okay. Today, we are only going to focus on two types. But remember, there are many, many types of machine learning models. After every six months, a new type comes into the market. Okay. Fine. But remember, 95% of the work done in the machine learning, learning industry is done on these two types. First type is called supervised learning model. Second type is called unsupervised learning model. What is the difference between the two? Well, in case of a supervised learning model, the data that I am using has features and target both. Whereas in case of an unsupervised learning model, the data that I am using only has features. It does not have target. Okay. Uh, then in the chat, I have a Student who has said that uh, in supervised learning model, we learn from data. Uh, well, in unsupervised also, you will learn from data. Okay. It's just that in supervised learning model, the data from where we'll run, learn, will have features and target both. Whereas in unsupervised learning model, the data from where we will learn will have only features. It won't have target. Okay. So remember that, right? Okay. Then supervised learning models were further divided into two types. First was classification model. Second was regression model. What is the difference between the two? Well, in case of a classification model, the data that I'm using in that data, the target column has finite set of possibilities. Whereas in a regression model, the data that I'm using in that data, the target column has infinite set of possibilities. Okay. With this, we have covered basics of machine learning. Does anybody have any doubt over basics of machine learning? Then do let me know. So guys, is basics of machine learning clear to everyone? Vaibhav, Manoj, Bhavesh, Binesh. Then we have other students, Jaikesh, Kiricha. Yes, okay. Fine. All right, so now that basics of machine learning are clear to you, let's move forward. So guys, uh, as we mentioned, today's session is going to focus on uh, a certification exam called DP100, okay? Remember that in this certification exam, you are only going to be asked MCQ questions in the examination. Okay, so you will be asked MCQ questions and all those questions will be related to how you can make machine learning models on the Azure platform. Okay, how you can make machine learning models on the Azure platform. So in order to make machine learning models on the Azure platform, there are three tools that Azure provides. Okay, there are three tools that Azure provides. The first tool is called Azure Notebook. I repeat, the first tool is called Azure Notebook. Okay. The second tool is called Azure ML Designer. Azure ML Designer. And the third tool is called Azure AutoML. The third tool is called Azure AutoML. 
So let's talk about these three tools and let's have a superficial overview of these three tools so that you understand the differences between the tools. OK, and let's go ahead. So over here, I will just open a notepad and through the notepad, I will try to explain to you the differences between these three tools that Azure offers. So I repeat, guys, uh, Azure offers three different tools in order to make machine learning models. OK, first tool is called Azure ML Designer. Sorry, Azure ML Notebook, I should say. OK, or you can call it Azure Notebook. The second tool is Azure Auto ML. OK, and the third tool is Azure ML Designer. OK, so let's see uh, the differences between these tools over here. So remember that in Azure Notebook, uh, you have to create machine learning models with code. And since you are doing it with code, you have complete control. You have complete control over the steps of creating the machine learning model. OK, so because you are creating a machine learning model over here with code, you have complete control over these steps. So let's say a particular step. If you want to tweak here and there, you can go ahead and do that tweaking. You can go ahead and do that customization. OK, fine. Uh, is this that they have offered this tool called Azure Notebook in which you can write code and whatever code you will write over there will run on Azure servers. OK, so uh, let's say you try to run a code, then whatever computation cost uh, will be there that will be deducted from your Azure subscription. OK, fine. So remember that. So whatever code you will run over there in Azure Notebook will run on Azure servers. So you will have to pay some computation cost. So every code that you will run, some computation costs will be deducted. Then after that, you have another tool called Azure Auto ML. So here you can create models without code. OK, so here you do not have. Control over the steps of creating a machine learning model. OK, so behind the scenes, what all steps are going to be implemented? What algorithm is going to be used to create a machine learning model? We know a machine learning model is a statistical representation of a real world process. That means in a machine learning model, we'll try to simulate a real world process using mathematics, using statistics. So what all mathematics will be used in the background? What all statistics will be used in the background? For that, you have no control whatsoever. So this Azure Auto ML is ideal for people who are from non-technical background. OK, so let's say if anyone is from non-technical background or let's say they don't know much about machine learning, but still they want to create a machine learning model. They can just open this tool called Azure Auto ML and specify what type of machine learning model they want to create and it will be created for them. OK, but remember here you don't have control over these steps. So let's say if the machine learning model that is created for you is not a good performing machine learning model. Let's say the accuracy of that machine learning model is not that good, then you can't do much about it because you don't have any control over these steps. Whereas in Azure Notebook, let's say the model that you create is not good, then you can always do some changes in the model, right? You can customize some steps and all of that. OK, but in Azure Auto ML, since you do not have much control over these steps, if at all you are unhappy with the performance of the machine learning model, you can't do much. OK. So remember that with Azure Notebook, you create machine learning models with code. OK, whereas in Azure Auto ML, you do not do it with help of code. OK, then we have something called Azure ML Designer. Here you create models using pre-written code. Which are called components. OK. So what you can do is uh, in Azure ML, you have to deal with components. What are components? Components are nothing but pre-written code. So all you have to do is you have to drag and drop the components. You have to drag and drop the components in the designer canvas. OK, so in this tool called designer, there will be something called canvas, Okay, which is a blank sheet. So on that blank sheet, you can drag and drop those components that you want to use to create a machine learning model. And you can also mention the order that, OK, first run this component 
then run the next component and so on. You can specify the order in which you want the components to run. Okay. But uh, again, over here, the code is pre-written. Okay. So here you do have little more customization as compared to AutoML. In AutoML, you didn't have any customization whatsoever. Okay. Here you do have customization. Here you can, for you know, uh, mention the steps yourself. Okay. Uh, so what you can do is you can mention that you want this component to run first. Then you want another component to run later and so on. Like that you can specify. Okay. But here again, the code is pre-written. Okay. The code is pre-written. Uh, so fine. These are the three tools that Azure offers in order to create machine learning models. So guys, in which tool do we have the most customization available to us? In which tool do we have most customization available to us? Anyone? So as uh, Pranav, Binesh, Ganesh and Manoj are saying, it's the Azure Notebook tool. There you have the most customization available to you. There you have more control available okay so uh, as a technical guy uh, this is the tool that i will suggest to you okay whereas auto ml uh, tool and designer tool i mean you can use it but uh, since you don't have that much control uh, over uh, you know the things that are happening in that tool uh, it's better to not use it as a technical guy i will always prefer azure notebook okay Fine. Uh, uh, auto ML and uh, uh, auto ML tool and designer tool are created for those people who don't know much about coding. Okay. Uh, so it's created for those uh, types of people. However, for technical guys like you and me, I will always prefer the notebook. Way. Fine. So these are the tools available. You can use any tool that you are okay with. At the end of the day, all the tools will help you to create a machine learning model only. Okay. Fine. And today, guys, uh, we'll be using this particular tool only, Azure Notebook tool. Okay. In fact, let me show you how those tools look like. So what I will do is I will try to search for Azure ML. Uh, remember, I'm trying to use the Azure ML service in Azure. So in order to uh, uh, use that service, I will have to create a resource of that service. Okay. So let's try to use this service called Azure Machine Learning. And in order to use this service called Azure Machine Learning, I will have to create a resource of that service. I will have to create a resource of that service. And this applies across Azure, guys. In Azure, whatever service you want to use, whether it is machine learning service or any other service that you want to use in Azure, you have to create a resource of that service first. Okay. So let's go ahead. Let's create a resource of it. So we'll go ahead and we'll create a resource. Let me click on the Create button. Okay, and uh, over here, when I do that, I am redirected to a form that I have to fill. So let me fill in the details of the form. The first field in the form is asking me to select subscription. So remember that in your one Azure account, you can have more than one subscriptions available to you. So let's say, for example, I have this Azure account. Okay, I have this Azure account over here called smitsha397 at, at, at the rate gmail.com. This is my Azure account. Now in this account, I can have more than one subscriptions. Okay, in the first subscription, I can have different amount of money left. Let's say the first subscription, I have $800. In the second subscription, I could have just $5 left and so on. Okay, so we can have different different uh, subscriptions in our account. Uh, each subscription can have different amount of money left in it. It can have different amount of permissions of, uh, uh, granted to it. Okay. So let's say, for example, I have this Azure account and for my team, I can create different, different subscriptions for the people of sales team. I will create another subscription wherein there will be different permissions, different amount of money in it for the people of my IT team. I will create a different subscription with different permissions and with different amount of money uh, uh, left in it. OK, and so on. So like this, remember that in your Azure account, you can have more than one subscriptions. Each subscription will have different permissions allocated to it and different amount of money left in it. OK, so depending on your choice, you have to select the subscription that you want to work with. OK, here uh, previously I had more subscriptions in my story uh, in my Azure account. However, those other subscriptions, I deactivated them. So currently I only have one active subscription with me, which is this MSDN subscription. OK, so this is provided to me by Microsoft. 
since i am a microsoft certified trainer this subscription has been given to me by microsoft okay in order to deliver lectures okay fine so let me select this subscription after that there is another field in the form which is asking me to mention details about a resource group remember we are creating a resource of azure machine learning service so that resource should be in some of the other resource group in azure whatever resource you create of any service not just machine learning service in azure you create a resource of any service azure will ask you to put that resource in some of the other resource group why what are the benefits of uh, having a resource group let's try to understand so let's say you are working on a project in your office and for that project you have created multiple resources let's say first you created a resource of sql service that is offered by azure next you created a resource of mongodb service that is offered by azure next you created a resource of azure ml service that is offered by azure and so on like that you created let's su suppose 20 resources okay now let's suppose that project went on for 6 months and after 6 months now that project is of uh, has expired okay so now you have no use for the resources in your project so what will you do will you go inside each of the resource one by one and delete them well you can do that you can go to each of the resource one by one and delete them but that will be a very tedious process why because you have 20 resources created so you'll have to go inside each of those 20 resources one by one individually and then click on the delete, delete button to delete it okay which will be a very tedious process so why don't we have these resources that belong to the same project inside the same resource group why don't we have these resources that belong to same project inside the same resource group so you can think of a resource group as a folder you can think of a resource group as a folder that will contain the resources so when the time for deleting the resources will come instead of deleting the resources one by one what you can do is you can directly delete the entire resource group which is the folder that contains the resources okay so you can directly delete the resource group with that all the resources in that resource group will directly get deleted in one go okay so resource group helps for life cycle management that is one benefit life cycle management that if a resource if uh, resources have the same life cycle you know that uh, they will be of no use uh, after six months okay they have the same life cycle that okay uh, these resources after six months will be of no use for you they belong to one project and after six months they will be of no use for you so why don't you put those resources inside one resource group so when the time for deletion comes instead of deleting the resources one by one you have already put your resources inside of one resource group so you can directly delete the entire resource group altogether with that all the resources in that resource group will automatically get deleted so that is one benefit of resource group life cycle management what is the second benefit let's suppose for your project again you have created 20 resources okay let's say uh, first resource you have created is of azure sql service second resource that you have created is of azure auto uh, sorry azure uh, mongodb service third resource that you have created is of azure ml service and so on like that you created 20 resources now let's say you want to calculate the total cost incurred by your project so what can you do you can go ahead and go into each resources one by one and see the cost that okay for the first resource uh, around 13 dollars of uh, 13 dollars of money was deducted because of the first resource for the second resource azure charged you let's say 26 dollars for the third resource let's say azure charged you nine dollars and so on okay like that you can go inside each resource one by one calculate the cost incurred for each resource and at the end what you will have to do you will have to take the sum of all the costs and that's how you will calculate the overall cost incurred by your project but this could be very tedious right so is there a uh, way to achieve the exact same goal but in a much more uh, non-tedious manner yes there is so what you can do is since these resources belong to the same project so why don't you have these resources that belong to same project inside of one resource group okay and if you want to calculate the total cost of all the resources in that resource group what you can do is you can go to the resource group and with a single click of the button with a single click of the button there will be a button over there that will show you the total cost and with a single click of the button you will be able to get the total cost of all the resources in that resource group 
okay so it helps for cost management as well there are many other benefits okay uh, but yeah these are the main ones there are other benefits okay so basically resource group helps you to manage the resources better okay remember that the resource group helps you to manage the resources better and azure has made it mandatory that whatever resource you will create in azure it has to fall within some of the other resource group okay right so here you can select a existing resource group or create a new one let me create a new one let me call it webinar rg okay or i'll get a different name in some webinar rg webinar synergetics rg okay fine i have given it some name over here fine next it is asking me to give a name to the resource of azure ml service so let's give it a name so i will call it webinar uh, ml resource okay webinar ml resource then it is asking me to select the region in which the resource will lie so this resource you want to upload in which server of uh, azure okay in the servers of east us or west us or what what region do you want that resource to be uploaded into okay so you can select the region of your choice make sure to select a region closer to your user let's say you are creating this resource for a user in india then make sure to choose a region closer to india just for better latency okay so if your user is in india then you will make sure that this resource is also uploaded in india in some server in india just for better latency nothing else okay fine so you can select the region of your choice over here any region will work okay after that it is asking me to select storage account so guys since a few years azure has made it mandatory that you link your machine learning resource with another resource called storage account resource okay so there is another resource called storage account resource okay so you can think of storage account as a competitor of google drive so you know google drive it's a product launched by google right wherein you can upload any type of files similarly storage account is a product launched by azure where you can upload any type of files okay so let's say you're going to work on some data so what azure says is okay you might need a storage account to upload your data so you can upload your data on a storage account okay even if you upload it in some other place even that's fine okay not a issue at all okay let's say instead of storage account you have uploaded your data in some sql database even that is fine not a worry but here uh, most developers what they do is they try to upload their data on storage account okay so azure has made it mandatory to link that storage account resource with the azure ml resource fine even though after linking you do not upload your data into a storage account resource that's fine not a issue but here they have made it mandatory because most of the developers out there prefer to use storage account to upload their data remember storage account is like a uh, google drive for beginners out there uh, just remember this uh, without going into the details much remember storage account is like a google drive just like in google drive you can upload any type of files in storage account you can upload any type of files okay fine so here you can link that storage account resource with the azure ml resource so you can either link a, a new one that azure is creating by itself or you can yourself create a new one also okay however if there is some existing storage account resource that you want to use you can go ahead and do that so let's say for my, for my walmart client i had created the storage account i can go ahead and select that as well not an issue but fine i will let azure itself create a new one you can see it has created a new storage account resource in the backend fine all right then next we have something called key vault so what is a key vault let's try to understand it okay so uh, let's understand this concept of key vault with the help of some slides so why this key vault was introduced okay why this key vault was introduced so uh, let me open these slides for you okay so suppose guys you are working on a project okay wherein uh, you have some data some sensitive data in uh, azure sql database let's say you have some sensitive data over there and what you have done is you have created a virtual machine in azure which is nothing but that you have rented a computer from azure okay let's say you have rented a computer from azure uh, and in that computer that you have rented from azure you are going to go ahead and put in your code 
okay let's say you're going to go ahead and put in your code now uh, let me ask this one thing guys in order for me in order for me to in order for my code to access the data instead of azure uh, to access the data in azure sql database can i say i will have to first give some authentication to azure sql database only then i will be able to access it agreed bhavish okay bhavish yes i'll talk about that uh, pricing tier as well okay so going forward i'll explain that pricing tier concepts as well to you okay but your bhavish and other students uh, the question that i am asking is let's say you have rented some computer from azure that means you have uh, created a virtual machine or in a simple words you have rented some machine some computer from azure on that computer you have uh, uploaded your code okay and what you want to do is uh, through that code you want to access the data instead of azure sql database where azure sql database allow anyone to access its data no right only if you give it necessary authentication so jaykesh if i want to access your home uh, can i uh, access it can anyone access your home no who will be able to access your home jaykesh only the person who has the key to your home correct jaykesh only the person who has the key to your home will be able to access it similarly only the person who has the key of azure sql database will be able to access it okay have a look so what i will have to do i will have to uh, take the key of azure sql database and put it in my code and my code uh, i'll put it in my code that okay access the sql database through this key but jaykesh can you tell me a problem with this approach what could be a problem what could be a problem with this approach jaykesh that you are storing the key in your code okay so for example let me show you how that would look like so i will just show you one of the uh, coding files that i have worked with previously have a look so let me upload let me show you one of the coding files here it is so here guys i tried to use another service of azure and uh, okay let me show you how that key would look like over here mm, i'll just go to azure portal okay let's say i have created any resource of azure and i want to access it whether it is sql database or some other uh, some other resource does not matter let's say i want to access it then how can i do it let's see one second uh, over here i want to show you uh, keys and have a look how the keys look like this is how the key looks like over here some alpha numeric characters i mentioned okay so there are two keys available for any resource uh, in order to access any resource there will be two keys provided to you by azure just like for our house we have two keys okay uh, here you can see two keys are there just like for our house we have two keys Uh, similarly azure provides two keys so that if anything happens to the first key let's say it's corrupted or something happens at least you can use the second one fine so what i'm saying jaykesh is this particular key suppose i'll be passing it to my code okay suppose i'll be passing it to my code and fine in that uh, code that i've written i'll be mentioning the key that okay through the key try to access the sql database okay so jaykesh with that can i say that anyone who has access to my coding file will be able to see the key can i say that anyone who has access to my coding file will be able to see the key is this a secure way jaykesh that anybody who has access to my coding file will be able to see the key no this is not secure na then what will happen anyone who has access to the, your coding file will be able to see your key and they will be able to use the resource this is not secure okay so instead of that why don't we do this one thing why don't we do this one thing let's have a separate the resource called key vault resource okay we'll have a separate resource over here called key vault resource okay and what that will do is that particular resource will store the key so your key will not be stored in your application code your key will be stored in a different resource but but tell me a problem with this approach as well tell me a problem with this approach so my key will be stored over here in this key vault resource so jaykesh can i say in order for me to access the key in a key vault i will need some uh, i will need 
to authenticate to key vault na only then i will be able to get the key or key key for it yes or no for me to access the key inside of a key vault first i will have to provide that authentication to key vault na key vault is a separate resource so can i say jaykesh and bhavesh i will have to provide some authentication to key vault first only then i will be able to use the key yes i agree this is a secure way as compared to the previous approach i agree but you will okay there is not bad there is a, a secure way as compared to previous approach but even here what you will have to do is you will have to provide some authentication to azure key vault only then it will give you access to the key so you will have to authenticate to it so you will have to mention some configuration details fine so yes this is better than what you had previously but this is not fully secure okay uh, so that's why guys instead of key vault nowadays what developers use is some other approach what do they use let me show you that approach okay so remember yes key vault is a better way to uh, 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 you know uh, work with okay instead of just putting your key in a coding file it's better to put your key in a key vault okay uh, so that uh, and the person who has the coding file will not get access to your key but still what you will have to do in order to get access to this key which is inside of a separate resource called key vault you will have to authenticate to that key vault so you'll have to provide that key vault config that's why guys we have a concept called manage identities okay so what companies wanted is the companies wanted a scenario wherein you do not provide any secrets whatsoever in your code see currently can i say bhavesh that anybody uh, who has access to my code will be able to see this key vault configuration and if they get access to key vault configuration can i say they will be getting access to my key vault agreed bhavesh anybody who has access to my code will be able to see this key vault configuration and anybody who sees this key vault configuration will be able to get access to my key vault if they get access to my key vault they will be get getting access to the key with that key they can get access to the azure sql database so again not fully secure okay again not fully secure so that's why guys we have a concept called managed identities okay managed identities so this is a better concept than key vault let me show you how it works okay let me show you how it works uh, there are two type of managed identities we have something called system assigned managed identity and we have something called user assigned managed identity so let me show to you how it works okay so bhavesh tell me one thing over here okay forget machine learning for now bhavesh uh, let's suppose you are working in a uh, office okay and uh, what you want to do is you want to get access to your office how do you get access to your office bhavesh forget machine learning in general i am asking you how do you get access to the office through what do you have to show something at the entry gate what do you have to show to get access to your office id card correct as manoj says id card so manoj wouldn't it be better that instead of me keeping the id card manoj is there is is there a danger that uh, if i have the id card let's say i have a barcode in my id card okay let's say uh, I, i have some id card with me okay uh, uh, i will have to carry that id card every time na manoj only then i will be able to get access if i don't have the id card with me then let's say i forget it then what to do so manoj wouldn't it be better if we hire a separate person who will stand in front of my office gate and he will uh, have the id card with him every time so what i will do is instead of me keeping the id card wouldn't it be better if i if i had a third person okay that third person will keep the id card with him so instead of me having the id card with me see i, I travel by train to the office okay what if i forget uh, i lose my id card in the train okay instead of that why don't we hire a separate entity okay a third person who will keep that id card with you who will keep that identity or who will keep your identity and when ever you want to go in the office that that person will be uh, at the office gate and he will just show his, uh, show your id card to the security team and you will be able to get access okay so there's a much better way right let's say if you are able to hire such a person Uh, who will be standing at the entry gate uh, always and instead of you uh, you know storing your id card in your bag that person itself will have your id card and when the time for uh, uh, entry will come that person will show your id card to the security team and you will get the access okay so this is much better way right but 
let's see a uh, so this is what happens in system managed identity okay system assigned managed identity where the system creates the id card for you okay where the system creates the id card so let's say when this code wants to authenticate with the sql database this code does not show does not need to show anything to sql uh, okay what what will happen is active directory will show the id card to sql active directory will tell that okay this code should get access to sql okay so that entire authentication work will be done by this third party called azure active directory so this is like hiring a third person who will store our id cards and Okay, sorry guys, I think I got disconnected in between. There was some internet issue. I got disconnected. Sorry, I will repeat myself again. Okay, so what we were saying was, instead of me keeping the ID card, why don't we hire a third person that keeps the ID card? And if let's say I want to access something, then instead of me showing the ID card, this third person can show the ID card. Okay, and with that you can get the authentication. So now, can I say your code is completely free of secrets, Bhavish? Your code is completely free of secrets. Can I say that, Bhavish, Manoj, Jaikesh? Now my code is completely free of secrets, na? My code is completely free of secrets. Okay. So this is system assigned managed identity. But you tell me, Bhavish, if there are five, uh, let's say, Okay, I guess I'm uh, sorry, guys. I'm getting disconnected in the middle uh, due to some internet issue. Uh, is my voice back now? Is my voice back? Yes, okay. Let me try to change the internet. Okay, I've changed the internet. Hopefully, let's see whether that solves our problem or not. Okay, so Bhavesh uh, and other students, Jaikesh, Manoj, what I was saying was, this is better that uh, instead of me storing the ID card and showing it to the security team of my office, we hire a third person who keeps the ID card with him. And let's say if I go to the office, then that third person will always stay outside the gate of the office and he will show the ID card to the security team. So you don't have to worry about carrying the ID card with you. Okay, now. Uh, like this, Manoj, let's suppose all the people in your office try to hire this third person to store their ID cards. Let's say they also do not want to keep the ID cards with them. So they hire this third person. So let's say, Manoj, if there are, let's say, four people in your team, then that then that third person will have to store how many ID cards? If there are four people in your team, all of them hire this, this third person to store ID cards, then how many ID cards will this third person have to store? Four, right? He'll have to store four ID cards. Okay, he'll have to store four ID cards. Okay, one for the first person, one for second, one for third, one for fourth. Okay, so like that, let's say there are four virtual machines that I had from Azure. For each virtual machine, I will have to create one ID card, right? For each virtual machine, there will be one ID card created. So can I say, Manoj, after a certain point in time, this third person will have will have to store a lot of ID card ID cards in his pocket, and that third person I mean, it could get very difficult for him to work, right? Let's say this third person has to store a lot of ID cards in his pocket. Okay. Uh, although that third person should manage ideally because we are paying him, but it could get it could get tedious for him, right? It could get tedious. So Manoj, why don't we do this one thing? Let's say those four people in your team they are of the same team. Let's assume. So Manoj, is it is it not better that see uh, you have four people in your team? Let's say Manoj, you have Bhavesh, uh, you yourself, uh, you have Jaikesh and me in your team. Let's say we are of the same uh, level, okay? Uh, we are uh, we are of the same level in the office, so we'll be getting the same access. Uh, everything everything is same for us. So Manoj, isn't it better that for all of us for for all of uh, the four people in the team, since we are the same team, we have the same access. Why don't we have one single ID card for all of our four people? Okay. Isn't it better to have one single ID card? What do you think? So let's see if you come to the office, that person can show the ID card for your team. 
that okay manoj belongs to the it team and he should get access let's say if i come to the office that person will show the same id card that okay smith belongs to it team and give it give him the access so manoj isn't it better to have one id card for all the uh, members in the team what do you think J just a theoretical suggestion what do you think okay better ha huh, not fully secure ha huh, okay uh, i agree not fully secure okay but do you think scalable scalability wise scalability wise what do you think scalability wise better yes that uh, now what that person will have to do is instead of storing four id cards instead of storing four id cards because uh, uh, you are storing four id cards of four different people and instead of having four id cards of four different people who belong to same team why don't we have one id card for those four people and that is exactly what user assigned managed identity will do so in user assigned managed identity instead of having four different id cards you have a single id card for all of those four entities okay and when the time for giving access will come let's say uh, manoj you are going to the office then that third person will show that id card to the security team saying manoj belongs to id team so give him give him access let's say i come to the office that third person will show that same id card to the security team and say that okay smith uh, belongs to it team so give smith the access and so on okay this is what is user assigned managed identity okay so i showed you three ways to gain access uh, to a separate resource so first was um, mentioning your key directly in the code which is not the secure option right this was the first approach where i mentioned the key directly in the resource uh, directly in my coding file uh, what was the second approach that i told you instead of that what is this, what was the second approach which was a little secure than the first one what was the second approach key vault approach where you are not storing the key in your code but you are storing the key in a separate resource called key vault resource but still in order for you to get access to the key inside of a key vault you will need to get an authentication to key vault so for that you will have to provide some configuration details okay so even key vault is not fully secure so instead of that what we are doing we are moving to another concept okay so first we saw a concept wherein we stored our key in our in our coding file that was not secure so we moved on to our second concept called key vault even key vault you feel is not secure so after key vault dot what option did we saw so after key vault what was that called which was more secure than key vault which was more secure what was that manage that entity right manage that entity so it's like that okay uh, uh, instead of you carrying the id card with you for authentication why don't we hire this third person okay why don't we hire this third person and that third person will store our id card okay and at the beginning you will tell your security team that okay security team look i am not going to take my id card every time okay so i am hiring this third person called azure active directory that third person uh, will uh, 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 do this uh, it will show the id card to you okay so you will tell uh, your resource okay let's say you will tell your end resource you will tell your target resource that i am not going to show the id card to you okay you will get the id card from this third party resource called azure active directory okay so it's like let's say i am trying to gain again access to my office then instead of me showing the id card to the security team i'll tell my security team that okay security team please see that i am not going to show the id card to you every day i am hiring this third person who will have my id card and he will stand at the gate and whenever i will come he will show the id card to you okay ha ah. now jaykesh uh, as you mentioned we'll have to tell this information to the security team na we'll have to tell this information uh, just but it is a one time process it is a one time process i agree with you that first uh, you will have to tell the security team provide authentic i mean uh, you will have to uh, you know uh, tell it that okay this third part third person that i am uh, giving the id card to is a good person okay uh, you will tell the security team that you will uh, give the authentication to that third person but it's a one time process only okay it's a one time process and in that one time process you will finish it okay so in the in that one time process you will make sure that you hire that third person uh you tell the security team that okay this third person is good he will not uh, lose my id card nothing like that 
and going forward you deal with this third person and with that one time process then my job is done now i don't have to get carry id card uh, id card forever in my life okay whereas with key vault it was not a one time process every time when i wanted to gain access to the resource uh, i had my key stored somewhere inside of a key vault okay i had my key stored somewhere inside of a key vault let me sh go show that to you i had a key stored somewhere inside of a key vault and in order for me to use the key inside of a key vault i had to mention, i had to authenticate to my key vault every time okay uh, and uh, uh, how could i authenticate by providing some configuration details okay so it was not a one time process whereas with managed identity can i say it's a one time process okay i will tell my target resource that going forward i'll not i will not show you my id card i will have this third person who will have my id card i will give the authentication and every every details to this target resource and it's a one time process then it's done okay so this is how managed identity is much better for security purposes as compared to key vault okay uh, Amir, I agree. Huh. So, Amir, can I say hiring this third person will increase the cost for you? Hiring this third person will increase the cost for you because you will hire this third person to uh, uh, store your ID card and all of that. It will increase the cost. And I agree, the cost will increase. Okay. So, like that, hiring this Azure Active Directory to store your ID cards, with that, your cost will increase a little. Yes. But you don't have to worry. I mean, apart from cost, you don't have to worry about security aspect because Azure Active Directory is the best uh, resource that deals with security. Okay, so you don't have to worry about maintenance and all of that. How Azure Active Directory will store your ID cards, uh, what it will do, you don't have to worry. Azure has run, has its own algorithm for the same that will manage it for you. Okay, so. That is what it does. I agree with that. The cost will increase. But as far as maintenance is concerned, you don't have to worry. See how that third person is behaving. How is he storing the ID card in the left pocket or in the right pocket? You don't have to worry. It's just that you will trust on it. Okay. And we know Azure Active Directory is the best uh, service created by Azure uh, to store your ID cards. Okay. It's the best service uh, created by Azure. Okay. Uh, uh, so yeah, I agree that cost will increase because you are using this service to store your ID cards. But apart from that, you don't have to worry. Okay, fine. All right. So guys, as I mentioned, instead of storing your keys directly, we have a better approach called Key Vault. And instead of Key Vault, we have a better approach called Managed Identity. Coming back to our uh, Azure ML resource, the one that we are creating, you see there is an option to create a Key Vault resource. Okay. Remember that uh, uh, going forward. Uh, uh, there is a better approach instead of key vault called managed identity. But here by default, what Azure ML is doing is it is trying to connect to a key vault. Okay. It is trying to create a key vault resource so that it, uh, if in case you want to store your keys in a key vault, uh, then you can go ahead and do it. But remember, there is a better way uh, as compared to key vault, which is called managed identity. Okay. Fine. Now, so you can uh, create a new key vault resource where you can store your keys going forward. Uh, you can see here it's already create creating a new one for me. Okay, if you want to select any existing one, uh, already I have not created uh, any existing uh, key vault resource previously. Uh, but if at all you had created it, you could select it from this drop down over here. Okay, but I don't have any other key vault resource ready with. Me. Fine. So here I am letting Azure create a new one for me. Okay. After that, we have a field called Application Insights. So uh, remember, we are creating a Azure machine learning resource. Okay, remember we are creating a ma Azure machine learning resource. So all those insights, like what was the uh, training time took to train the model, uh, then how how many times has the model been used by people? Okay, all of those insights. Uh, then uh, uh, what is the health of that model? Uh, let's say that model is stored in some server. Are you able to get access? Are uh, is the access to that server? Uh, being done or not, or is, is the server uh, not in a healthy state? All of those insights you will be able to get from this resource called Application Insights resource. So here, Azure is already creating a new one for you. However, if you want to select any existing Application Insights resource that you have already created, you can do that as well. However, here I will let Azure create a new one for me. Okay. Then 
if you want to uh, work with any uh, docker image okay if you want to integrate any docker image then you can go ahead and do that over here as well fine i don't want to do any of that okay so i will not i'm not going to integrate any docker image anything like that fine so uh, let's go ahead over here and uh, uh, let me ask azure to review the details entered by me and after reviewing the details entered by me i will go ahead and ask azure to create the resource so fine i'll click on review plus create button and with that azure will run a validation in the backend just to check whether it can give me the things that i'm asking for if the validation is successful what will happen is uh, the create button will be enabled i'll click on that create button and now a resource of azure ml uh, service will be created okay and once the resource is created i will show you how you can use the resource as i mentioned in the azure ml resource you will get three tools available to you first tool is azure notebooks second tool is azure auto ml third tool is azure ml designer okay remember that for technical people like you and me azure notebook is the best approach for non technical people uh, they can choose any one between auto ml tool and machine learning designer tool but fine but for, for technical people like you and me i will always prefer the first option okay but why because you have more control uh, over the steps of creating the model that is in the second and third one you don't have lot lot of control okay uh, saravasan how does azure active directory uh, work uh, okay now saravanan that's a different topic uh, once i uh, complete my dp100 curriculum for today i will talk to you about that as well that what is the internal working currently i have just given you an overview just so that you can understand that okay instead of storing the key directly in your code you have a better way to store your key you can store your key in a key vault okay uh, however even key vault is not uh, secure as such so instead of key vault you can go to uh, another uh, way of uh, uh, doing authentication which is through azure active directory where azure active directory will store your id cards and you don't have to your coding file does not have to worry about storing any id card or any other information whatsoever okay so once our uh, curriculum of dp10 of uh, 100 is over for today i will show the in detail working of that also however the working will take around uh, 30 to 40 minutes so right now i am not diving into it because our other remaining curriculum will, will not be able to cover okay our goal for today will not be able to cover fine ha huh. and now ragu says uh, when we are creating a model uh, how do we do it okay so ragu that's what we are going to uh, do ahead okay up till now we have not dived into it currently ragu all we have said is what is machine learning then in order to do machine learning we need to use something called machine learning model so what is a machine learning model okay and in order to create a machine learning model in azure azure provides these three main things and i just wanted to show you these three main things uh let me go ahead and let me show that to you so i'll go to azure ml resource and here there is a button to launch the studio of azure ml so let me launch that studio and this is the studio in which i'll be able to do the work so as i mentioned there are three main tools provided by azure okay first is azure notebooks okay you can see if i open it up okay if i open it up i can create a coding file over here and in that coding file i can go ahead and write down my code okay i can go ahead and write down my code you can see this is the coding file that is created i can go ahead and write down my code whatsoever fine the second main tool provided by uh, azure is auto auto ml here you don't have to write any code whatsoever all you will do is you will provide uh, the details of the machine learning model that you want to build okay you will provide those details over here by clicking on this plus button okay uh, when you click on it a form will open up and in that form you can provide the details and once you have provided the details the machine learning model will be created for you okay then next you have something called azure ml designer here guys you have pre written or a pre written code available to you in the form of components so let's say i'm creating a canvas over here of azure machine learning designer then what i can do is there are pre written code uh, available in the form of components so let's say i want to do data transformation first okay let's say i have some uh, data with me okay uh, i can go ahead and uh, uh, get some uh, pre built data i can also work on my custom data that's different but let's say i want to work on this data i'll just drag that component put it on my canvas 
let's say on that data, what do I want to do? I want to, let's say, add some rows into it. So I'll go ahead and drag this component called add rows after the, okay, and then I'll connect it. And I will show you how to do that in detail. Currently, I'm just giving an overview so that you understand it a little. Okay, in detail, I'll explain to you. Let's say after this, what you would want to do is you would want to apply this algorithm called uh, decision tree regressor algorithm. So you'll apply it and so on. I'll show you in detail how to do it, so don't worry. But remember here in designer tool, what happens? Pre-written code is available in the form of components. So all you have to do is drag and drop those components over here. Okay, drag and drop those components. So these are the three main ways in which you can create machine learning models on Azure. Okay, I'll show you those three ways in detail. Um, although today do will work with the first approach only, notebook approach. Okay, uh, but don't worry. After showing that to you, I will talk about all the other options available in machine learning. But remember to create models, we have these three main ways available to us. What are all these other options available? I'll explain that to you in detail, so don't worry about it. But just to revise now, just to revise that we were focusing on a concept called machine learning, right? Why? Because your entire DP100 examination is based on how you can create machine learning models with Azure. Okay, so we first understood what is machine learning, right? Uh, we understood that machine learning is a set of tools that is used for two purposes. First is to get inferences from data. Second is to get predictions from data. How do we do that? We have already learned it earlier. We do that by using something called a machine learning model. What is a machine learning model? We have learned it earlier. That's the statistical representation of a real world process. In simple words, we are trying to use some statistics or we are trying to use some mathematics to simulate what would happen in the real world. So we understood what is machine learning. We understood what is a machine learning model. Okay. Uh, now I have another question over here. I have another question. So guys, what are the two notes to remember in order to create a machine learning model? Anybody remembers those two notes? What are those two notes that I mentioned? Anybody remembers any one out of those two notes? Correct. Manoj mentions that in the data that we are uh, so. Uh, Manoj mentioned that first note is that in order to create a machine learning model, we need some data to work with, and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. Then Manoj also mentions that note two is that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. Okay, so feature columns are those columns that help me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. Okay, target column is that column that I want to predict. Fine. So we have understood what is machine learning. We have understood what is a machine learning model. And we have understood the two nodes to create a machine learning model. Now, I want you to focus on the types of creating a machine learning model. So as I said, guys, how many types of machine learning models do we have? Do we have only two types or we have more than two? How many types of machine learning models do we have? And after doing this revision, I will talk about this doubt that has been given to me by Parag in the chat. Okay, so the question is how many different type of machine learning models? We have more than two guys. We have more than two as Manoj mentions, more than two. After every six months, a new type comes into the market. Okay, however, 95% of the work done in the machine learning industry is done on these two types. First type is supervised learning models. Second type is unsupervised learning model. But it doesn't mean that we don't have any types apart from these two. Okay, there are many, many types. Okay, after six, two type comes into the market. Okay, but uh, how beneficial are those types? That's a different topic. But there are many, many types uh, of machine learning models. However, 95% of the work done in the machine learning industry is done on these two types only. First type is supervised learning model. Second type is unsupervised learning model. So Pranav, I have a question for you. Pranav, what is the difference between a supervised learning model and an unsupervised learning model? What is the difference? What is the difference? Uh, no, Pranav. That uh, concept applied to, uh, that answer applied to a different answer. 
can anyone tell me the difference between supervised learning model and unsupervised learning model? Uh, Manoj has given the difference. Manoj says, in supervised learning model, the data that I am using has features and target both. In supervised learning model, the data that I am using has features and target both. Whereas in unsupervised learning model, the data that I am using only has feature columns. It does not have target column. Okay. So remember this difference that in supervised learning model, the data that I am using has features and target both. In unsupervised learning model, the data that I am using only has features. It does not have target. Now, supervised learning models are further divided into two types. What are they? First is classification. Second is regression. Okay. So supervised learning models are further divided into two types. First is classification. Second is regression. What is the difference between the two? As Pranav mentioned earlier, in a classification model, my target column has finite set of possibilities. Whereas in a regression model, as Bhavesh says, my target column has infinite set of possibilities. Right. So in a classification model, my target has finite set of possibilities. In a regression model, my target has infinite set of possibilities. Fine. With this, basics of machine learning are over. Okay. So we have completed basics of machine learning. And guys, in order to create machine learning models, what are the three main ways that Azure offers? How many ways does Azure offer? So we know what is machine learning. We know what is machine learning model. We know the types of machine learning models. But in order to create these machine learning models, Azure offers how many approaches? Three, as Raghu says, three approaches. First is notebooks. Second is AutoML. Third is designer. These are the three approaches or three tools that it offers. Okay. Out of the three tools, Raghu, which is the one that developers should prefer? Uh, which is the tool that in which I have the most flexibility? In which I have more control over the working? Notebook tool, right? Okay. Which is the tool in which I have least flexibility, least control? Least control? Least control. AutoML. AutoML is the one where I, where I have least control. Okay. You can't even uh, know that, okay, in the background, what, what is the order of these steps and so on. Okay. Yeah, there is no code to be written, nothing. You will just mention the details of the machine learning model that you want to build. That's it. Okay. Uh, in the background, how these steps will be implemented for creating a machine learning model, uh, nothing, nothing will be uh, 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 provided to you. None of those details will be provided to you in AutoML. So in Notebook tool, you have the most control. In AutoML tool, you have least control. Whereas in Designer tool, you have, you have moderate control. So in Designer, yes, pre-written code is given to you in the form of components. Uh, all you have to do is drag and drop those components onto the canvas. But you can manage these steps that, okay, this component you want to execute first, this component you want to execute second, this component you want to execute third and so on. So here you have moderate controls. So the tool have giving you most control is notebook tool. The tool giving you least control is AutoML tool. The tool giving you moderate control is designer. And you can, you can select the tool of your choice. Now let's move forward. So up till now, guys, everything is uh, clear to you. Making sense? Making sense, guys? Yes? Yes, Manoj, okay. And I hope all the students are also clear with it. If there is any doubt, you can let me know. Okay. Fine. Now, let's move forward. So, Manoj, I have a question. Uh, now, we know what is machine learning. Machine learning is a set of tools used for two approaches, inferences and uh, to get predictions, right? Those are the two uh, use cases of uh, using machine learning. Uh, and in order to uh, fulfill those use cases, we have to use something called a machine learning model. Okay, fine. Now, uh, 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 Manoj and other students remember that uh, there are different, different algorithms that you can use in order to create a machine learning model. Okay, there are different algorithms that you can use. Let me show you one such algorithm. Okay, we'll see many algorithms today. So the first machine learning algorithm that I will show you is called K nearest neighbors. Okay, this is our first machine learning model algorithm. Machine learning model algorithm. 
okay the name of that algorithm is k nearest neighbors also known as knn for short okay in short it is also known as knn okay now uh, before we go ahead uh, since it's one and a half hour of time that i have already taken uh, you might want a break to refresh yourself so we'll take a 10 minute break and after that what we'll do is uh, we'll focus on our first machine learning model algorithm okay called knn so one, just take a 10 minute uh, break to freshen yourselves up and then we'll move on to this new concept up till now what we have done we have understood what is machine learning we have understood what is a machine learning model we have understood the different types of machine learning model and in order to implement those machine learning models in azure we have three tools available to us and what are those three tools i have talked about right so let's take a short 10 minute break you can freshen yourselves up and after the break we'll come back and uh, we'll move, to, move on to a new topic then. I'll just uh, make sure to set up this clock. I'll set the timer over here. And after 10 minutes, we'll be back, guys, and we'll move on to a new topic. Till then, we'll just take a short key break to freshen ourselves up. Until then, I'll just be on mute.
हेलो गाइस आई शेयर द कॉम्प्लीमेंट्री लर्निंग अचीवमेंट बेस्ट फॉर डी पी वन हंड्रेड सो गाइस गो एंड विदिन ऑफ बेच यू ऑलरेडी मैंशन द स्टेप जस्ट यू हैव टू फॉलो द स्टेप एंड यू विल गेट एक्टिवेटेड बेच okay so i can see one doubt in the chat mahesh is asking uh, what we have to do so mahesh uh, uh, you can see archie has pasted a link in the chat so basically mahesh uh, since you are attending this training of dp100 uh, for attending this training you will be provided with a badge from microsoft okay which suggests that okay you have gone through this training of dp100 limit okay and uh, in order to get that badge you have to follow these steps that archie uh, archie has mentioned in the chat do you see those steps or if there is some issue then let me know got it mangesh so in order to uh, you know give you some token that okay you have attended this training we are providing you with a badge from microsoft site and uh, in order to avail that batch you have to follow these steps once you get the batch then you can uh, publish it on any social media platform like linkedin whatever fine i hope mangesh you got it if at all there is some issue uh, then do let me know if there is some additional doubt let me know fine all right i hope other students are back other students are back guys should we proceed forward everybody back Mohammad, and Smitan Jai, Raghu. I hope everybody is back. Yes, Amir. Okay. Fine. So let's move forward, guys. So Amir and other students, what we did was first we looked into what is machine learning. 
then we looked into what is a machine learning model now amir and other students let's understand uh, the different algorithms of creating a machine learning model okay uh, and ha parag has a doubt can we uh, parag has a doubt that please confirm if we use service principle so uh, you can say parag that manage the identity is just like a service principle okay however there are certain differences uh, once i cover my curriculum of dp 100 I will show you the practical differences between them, but you are absolutely right. You can say uh, it's is the same concept as a service principle. Okay, though there are certain minute differences between them. Okay, and I will practically show you the differences once I am done with my DP one hundred curriculum for today. Got it, Parag? Okay. Uh, I'll I practically explain so it will be more clear, more easy. No, no. Aha. Uh -huh. I mean, you can use it. Uh, however, I feel that uh, uh, using minus identities is better. Okay, but uh, you can use service principle as well. Okay, in my view, minus identity is better. When I show you the practical difference, na at that time you will also understand why it is better. But to answer a question, yes, you can use service principle as well. Okay, fine. Uh, so let's go ahead. So guys, we covered what is machine learning. we covered what is a machine learning model now it's time to look into the different algorithms of creating a machine learning model so you can create your own algorithm or you can use some of the existing algorithms that are already used by machine learning engineers out there okay so it depends on you whether you want to create your own algorithm or use any existing ones let's see what are the existing algorithms available in the market the first algorithm that we will see is called k nearest neighbors also known as knn so you might wonder this algorithm is used for which type of a machine learning model is it used for a supervised machine learning model or is it used to create a unsupervised machine learning model so remember that this algorithm is used to create a supervised machine learning model that means that this algorithm only works if your data has feature column and target column both okay feature column and target column both then you might wonder within supervised uh it is which type of uh, uh within supervised this algorithm is used to implement which type of model classification model or regression model where uh this is used for classification purposes okay this is used for classification purposes that means this algorithm called knn can only be used only if your target column has finite set of possibilities okay when i say that this algorithm can only be used for classification purposes that means i am saying that this algorithm called knn can only be used only if my target column has finite set of possibilities you know right classification means a data in which my target column has finite set of possibilities okay so as i mentioned that in order to implement your machine learning model uh you can use your own algorithm or use any existing algorithms that are available in the market so we are looking into one existing algorithm that is there in the market and uh, this is the first algorithm that we are studying and the name of that algorithm is k nearest neighbors also known as knn uh this algorithm is used for which purpose to build a supervised model or to build a unsupervised model it is used to build a supervised model and within supervised which type of model can we build with this algorithm can we build a classification model with this algorithm or a regression model with this algorithm well this algorithm is only used for classification purposes so you can only make a classification model with this algorithm okay let's see how it works now amir i have a question for you amir can i say that for making any machine learning model i will need some data to work with can i say that amir can i say that that in order to create a machine learning model i need some data to work with yes or no guys we have seen two nodes to build a machine learning model one of the nodes as prara parag has mentioned in the chat one of the nodes is that in order to create a machine learning model we need some data to work with and that data needs to have some rows and sub columns so suppose i have some data to work with in that data i have some rows and sub columns i have three columns in total out of the three columns gender is my target column whereas let's assume that 
age and experience are my feature columns. Let's assume that age and experience are my feature columns. OK, fine. So I have some data to work with. Over. On this data, Parag, can I create a machine learning model? Yes. As per our first note of creating a machine learning model, we needed some data having some rows and some columns. And here you can see we do have some rows and we do have some columns. Fine. So on this data, I can create a machine learning model. Now I can create it using my own algorithm or a pre-existing algorithm. Let me use a pre-existing algorithm called k nearest name. So I'll be using that. Fine. But I have a question. Let me ask that question to Jaikesh. So Jaikesh, why is a machine learning model used? Just for time pass or why is a machine learning model used? What is the purpose of using a machine learning model? What is the purpose? As JK mentions, there are two purposes. First purpose is to obtain inferences from data. And second purpose is to obtain predictions from data. So JK, suppose I want to obtain predictions from data. Let's say right now, the goal of creating a machine learning model is to do predictions. Okay. So I want to do some predictions. So I want to predict that a new employee has entered my office. That employee has a uh, has some age and some experience. What is the gender of that employee? OK, so I want to go ahead and build a machine learning model for prediction purposes. All right, let's go ahead. So the first thing that I will do Jaikesh over here is that first I will just plot this data onto a graph. OK, just for better understanding of data, I will plot this data onto a graph. So let me go ahead and let me plot this data onto a graph. And I'll plot it in such a way that those points which have a gender value of male are colored in red and those points which have a gender value of female are colored in blue. Okay, so let me go ahead and let me plot the data onto a graph over here. I'll just go ahead and plot the data onto a graph. Fine, now let's move forward. So what do I have? I have my data. On this data, I want to build a machine learning model. Okay. You can build a machine learning model using a pre-existing algorithm or you can use your own algorithm as well. Up to you. Fine. All right. Now, what, what is the purpose of making a machine learning model over here? As JK has mentioned, there are only two purposes. First is to obtain inferences from data. Second is to obtain predictions from data. Okay. Fine. So suppose I want to obtain predictions. I want to predict that if I employ as an age of 21 years, and he has the experience of one year in the IT field, then what could be the gender of that person in that company? Okay, fine. So I want to do this prediction. Let's see how will we do it. Before we go ahead, I want to introduce this very important terminology. I want to introduce this very important terminology called labels. So what do you understand by labels? So guys, in machine learning terms, Label stands for your target column values. So your target column values are known as labels. Okay, so I have a question over here. That Jaikesh, how many labels do you see currently? How many labels do you see in your data? How many total target values? Jaikesh mentions two unique target values. But in total, Jaikesh, how many target values do you see in total? I agree with you. There are two unique target values or two unique labels. But in total, how many labels do you see in your data? In total, I have circled them for your reference. Four, right? Four labels. One, two, three, four. Four labels. Okay. So remember that in machine learning terms, target values are, are also known as labels. So I have four labels over here. Four labels. So Jaikesh, can I say that I have four labeled rows? Can I say, Jaikesh, that I have four labeled rows? Okay, four labeled rows. Perfect. Then, if I have four labeled rows, Jaikesh, then how many unlabeled rows do I have? How many unlabeled rows do I have? A, a row that does not have a label, how many such rows do we have? One, right? As Pragna and Jaikesh says, I have one unlabeled row. Okay, one unlabeled row. Fine. Let's go ahead and let's see on such a type of data how we can create a machine learning model. You can create a machine learning model using your own algorithm or you can use a pre existing algorithm. Let me use this pre existing algorithm called k nearest neighbors. Let's see how that algorithm works. 
the first step in that algorithm is to choose the number of neighbors. Okay. First step in that algorithm is to choose the number of neighbors. So let's go ahead and let's do that. Let's choose the number of neighbors. Suppose for the sake of the example, I'm choosing number of neighbors equal to three. Okay. Let's suppose for the sake of example, I'm choosing number of neighbors equal to three. So first step done. First step was to choose number of neighbors and I've done that. I've chosen my number of neighbors. Let's say my number of neighbors is equal to three. Now, my second step. Second step is depending on the number of neighbors, I will select that many closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. Okay. Now I have a question for, uh, for Pragna. So Pragna, uh, please let me know. In your graph, how many labeled points do you see? There were four labeled rows. So for those four labeled rows, can I say you created four labeled points? Four. Okay. Then Pragna, in your graph, how many unlabeled points do you see? One, right? So there were there was one unlabeled row. For that, you plotted one unlabeled point. Okay. Right. So Pragna, let's go ahead and let's see on such a data. How can I create a machine learning model? As I said, you can create a machine learning model using your own algorithm or you can use any pre-existing algorithm. Let me show you this pre-existing algorithm called K nearest neighbors. Let's see how it works. First step in K nearest neighbors was to choose number of neighbors. So let's suppose I chose number of neighbors equal to three. Then second step is depending on the number of neighbors, I will select that many closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. So here, Pragna, can I say that this is my closest labeled point? Agree with me? The one that I have circled, sorry, my mistake. Uh, I should restructure my sentence. It says, step two says, depending on the number of neighbors, I need to select that many closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. So can I say, Pragna, that this is my unlabeled data point? Unlabeled data point? Agree with me? This one, the one that I have circled? Yes. So with respect to this unlabeled data point, I have to select some closest labeled data points. With respect, with respect to this unlabeled data point, I have to select some closest labeled points. How many to select? As it is mentioned over here, it depends on number of neighbors. Pragna, how many number of neighbors have we selected? How many number of neighbors? If you uh, remember from our first step, we chose number of neighbors equal to three. Okay. I chose number of neighbors equal to three. From my first step, I chose number of neighbors equal to three. So since I chose three number of neighbors, that's why I will select three closest labeled data points. Okay. So with respect to this unlabeled data point, I will select three closest labeled data points. So can I say, Pragna, that on your screen, these are the three closest labeled data points. Agree with me? With respect to my unlabeled data point, these are the three closest labeled data points. Fine. So step two done. Now let's move on to step three. Okay. Step three is that depending, uh, step three is to make all of the selected label points to vote. So here I have selected three labeled points. So all of these three will vote. Red points will vote red, blue points will vote blue. So here Jaykesh, can you tell me how many votes will go to red? If these three labeled points will vote, remember they will vote in such manner that red points will vote for red, blue points will vote for blue. So how many votes will go to red color? How many votes will go to red color? Two. Perfect. Two votes to red. And Jaykesh, how many to blue? As Pragna has mentioned, one vote will go to blue. So two votes will go to red and one vote will go to blue. Perfect. Step three, done. So step one was done. Step two was done. Step three was done. Now, fourth and last step. Fourth and last step is based on majority of the votes, I will assign a label to the unlabeled data point. So here, guys, you tell me, Majority of the votes have gone to which color? Red or blue? Omad, what do you feel, buddy? Majority of the votes have gone to which color? Red or blue? Red, right? Majority of the votes have gone to red. That's why this unlabeled data point, this unlabeled data point will also be labeled as red. And Mohamed, red stands for which target value? Male or female? If you remember, red stands for which target value in our graph? Red stands for 
male target value, right? We had mentioned it earlier that in our graph, red color will stand for male target value. Okay. That means, Mohammed, over here, I'm predicting that the target value for this particular row will be equal to male. Okay. That means I'm predicting that the target value for this particular row will be equal to male. Okay. And you will see that is exactly what will be shown to you in this slide over here. So that's how I can go ahead and do make predictions using this algorithm. Okay, using this machine learning model algorithm called KNN. Okay, so there are four steps, right? Now, uh, from these steps, you might have felt something problematic in these steps. So tell me that you should have felt something problematic in any of these steps. Okay, you should have felt something problematic. Tell me. And based on that, we are going to do our uh, uh, explanation. Act. You should have found something problematic. There is something problematic in this in these steps. There is something problematic. What is that problematic thing? Ah, okay, Binesh says the same votes comes. Then what will happen is, let's say if there is a tie between red and blue, they are machine learning model algorithm will randomly select anyone between red and blue. Okay. So if there is a tie, then it will do random prediction. Fine. So that is another good point that Binesh mentioned. That one thing is problematic. But there is something even more problematic than that. What is it? In order for this algorithm to work correctly, you must have found something problematic over here. What is it? Can I say, guys, that there are four steps out of the four steps, the first step is to choose number of neighbors. How do I choose number of neighbors? That's the main thing. How do I know whether should I choose three number of neighbors? Or how do I know whether I should have choose five number of neighbors? How do I know whether I should choose 50 number of neighbors? What to do? That is one very important thing over here. Okay. And you will see that choosing number of neighbors is very, very important. Okay, choosing number of neighbors is very, very important. Let's understand why. So suppose I have a graph in which I have some labeled points that belong to red and brown color. In between, I have this unlabeled point. In between, I have this unlabeled point. Now suppose I'm choosing number of neighbors equal to three. So if let's say in my first step of the algorithm, I'm choosing number of neighbor equal to three. Then Jaikesh, what is the second step of the algorithm? What is the second step of the algorithm? Based on number of neighbors, I have to select that many closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. So here, since I chose three number of neighbors, I will choose three closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. Then third step is to make all of the selected label points to vote. The green points will vote green, brown points will vote brown. So here, Binesh, you tell me, majority of the votes will go to which color, green or brown? Here, if the selected label points vote, then majority of the votes will go to which color, green or brown. As you said, Binish, two votes will go to brown, one, one vote will go to green. So majority of the votes are going to brown. That's why, Binish, can I say that since majority of the votes are going to brown color, the unlabeled data point in the middle will be labeled as brown. Binish, can I say that? That the unlabeled data point in the middle will be labeled as brown. Okay. Fine. Perfect. And you can see in the middle, the unlabeled data point has been labeled as brown. Now, Vinish, let's take any, another example. Let's suppose instead of three number of neighbors, I'm choosing five number of neighbors. With three number of neighbors, you got a prediction for brown. Okay. With five number of neighbors, let's see. So again, with respect to my unlabeled data point in the middle, let's suppose in the middle, I have an unlabeled data point. With respect to that, let's suppose I'm choosing five number of neighbors. So that means I'm selecting five closest label data points. Let me do that. So now all of the five selected label points will vote. Green points will vote green, brown points will vote brown. So now Binesh, you tell me majority of the votes will go to green, which color, green or brown? Green, as Binesh mentions in the chat. Binesh mentions that three votes will go to green, two votes will go to brown. So majority of the votes will go to green color, right? Which is why the unlabeled data point in the middle will be predicted as green. Okay, and you will see the unlabeled data point in the middle will be predicted as green. 
so you can see with different number of neighbors i am getting different prediction so how to choose correct number of neighbors choosing correct number of neighbors is very important how to choose correct number of neighbors okay so choosing correct number of neighbors is one thing okay uh, then uh, let me explain that second thing to you okay so in the algorithm what is the second thing that you have to focus on so first was choosing number of neighbors okay so that is one important thing next thing depending on number of neighbors i will select that many closest labeled points now pragna you let me know how do i know which label point is closer or which label point is far away what do i need to calculate for that how to know which label point is closer which label point is far away what do we need to calculate we need to calculate something so for example if i want to know pragna that to my city whether bangalore is closer or uh, delhi is closer what i will calculate distance right distance so here we need to calculate distance now there are many different distance formulas which one to choose just like there are many options for number of neighbors there are many different distance formulas which one to choose let me show you that okay first i will show you all the options that are available which one to choose that's a separate topic i'll talk about that also okay so uh, just like choosing number of neighbors is important choosing the correct distance formula is also important so let me explain to you those distance formulas the first distance formula is euclidean okay the first popular distance formula is euclidean the second popular distance formula is manhattan okay the second popular distance formula is manhattan and the third popular distance formula is minkowski there are other distance formulas as well but uh, most of i mean in your career you won't use any one apart from these three uh, okay because the other ones are i mean not so preferred because of its working fine so these are the three uh, distance formulas that are widely used okay there are others uh, the other dis distance formulas also available but they are not widely used because of its working okay now uh, these are the three that are preferred first is euclidean second is manhattan third is minkowski okay so let me explain these formulas to you so let's suppose guys i just have one feature column in my data then in that scenario let me explain to you how euclidean distance formula will look like so it will look something like this the distance will be equal to uh, square root of x2 Minus x1 the whole square. So if you want to calculate distance between two points, let's say if you just have one feature column, okay. And if you want to calculate distance between two points, let's say if that feature column is called x, and if you want to calculate the distance between two points, then you will use this formula: square root of x2 minus x1 the whole square. Similarly, let's suppose I have one feature column. Let me call that feature column x. Then the Manhattan distance formula will look like. Modulus of x2 minus x1. So in Manhattan distance formula, how is it different to Euclidean distance formula? In Manhattan distance formula, you don't have square root, and you, I mean, the square root vanishes. The square also vanishes. Instead of square, you have something called modulus. Okay. Then in Minkowski distance formula, let me explain to you. Let's suppose if I have one feature column, let me call it x. Then how will Minkowski distance formula look like? It will be the whole term. Raised to one by p. Inside, I will have x two minus x one, the whole raised to p, where this p stands for a real number, and you can assign any real number to it. Now, which real number to choose? Because there are many many real numbers. Which one to choose? Depending on the data, I will explain that to you. Don't worry. Okay. But remember, this is the formula. This is the general formula. If you are dealing with one feature column in your data. Let's suppose I'm dealing with two feature columns in my data. Then how will the formulas look like? Let me call those two feature columns x and y. In that case, the Euclidean distance formula will look something like this. It will be square root of x two minus x one the whole square plus y two minus y one the whole square. Similarly, 
if i have two feature columns let me call those two feature columns x and y in that scenario how will the manhattan distance formula look like it will be modulus of x2 minus x1 plus modulus of y2 minus y1 similarly guys if i have two feature columns with me let me call them x and y again in that scenario how will the minkowski distance formula look like it will be the whole term okay it will be the whole term raised to 1 by p and inside i will have x2 minus x1 the whole raised to p plus y2 minus y1 the whole raised to p okay so this is how the formulas will look like in case of two feature columns similarly let's suppose i have three feature columns with then in that scenario how will the formulas look like let me explain that to you so if i have three feature columns with me guys let me call them x y and z in that scenario how will the distance formulas look like so it will be square root of okay can anyone tell me uh, the okay uh, pranav pranav can you tell me the formula for euclidean distance in case of three feature columns okay i guess in the chat it will be difficult for you to write the formula uh, i guess if uh, are you guys able to unmute yourself all right okay that option is it given okay so pranav uh, i'll give that uh, unmute access to you and please tell me the formula for uh, three feature columns in case of euclidean distance okay so pranav i will enable the mic for you I have enabled the mic for you, Pranav. You can x2 unmute. X two minus x one the whole square plus y two minus y one the whole square plus z two minus z one the whole square and so on. Based Perfect. on the number of feature columns. Correct. So this is the correct answer given by Pranav for Euclidean distance. Similarly, Pranav, if I have three feature columns, let me again call them x, y, and z. In that scenario, Pranav, how will the Manhattan formula look like? X two minus X one mod plus Y two minus Y one mod plus Z two minus Z. Perfect. And over here, Pranav has given the correct formula for Manhattan distance as well. Okay. Now, Pranav, at last, I'll need your one more help, uh, which is that in case if we are dealing with three feature columns, let me call them X, Y, and Z. Then, in that scenario, Pranav, how will the Minkowski distance formula look like? Uh, in the same way, x2 minus x1 raised to p plus y2 minus y1 raised to p plus z2 minus z1 raised to p. Okay, x2 so minus x1 raised to p plus y2 minus y1 raised to p plus z2 minus z1 raised to p, and the whole term will be raised to by one by p. one by one perfect. By. And Pranav, here this p stands for what? A real number. Real number. We can assign any real number, but which real number to choose? All of that I will explain again. So, Pranav, in total, in total, in this algorithm, what are the two main things that we have to decide? See, the steps are already pre-written, pre but in these steps, what are the two things that we have to decide? Value of k. I mean, the number of neighbors. Perfect. That is one thing. What is the second? Uh. Which formula we uh, should op opt for? I mean, Euclidean or uh, to calculate distance, uh, which formula to be used? Perfect. So, second is distance formula. Can I say if I find these two things, then my game is over? Correct, Pranav? The entire game uh, is about finding these two things. Yeah, nearest distance means. No, I'm not sure. Uh, no, no. Uh, for mm. first is number of neighbors as you mentioned, mm. and second is that okay based on number of neighbors we'll choose that many closest labeled points. So in order to know which label point is closer or far away, I need to know which distance formula to use. So if I find these two things, then that's it. Now game over here. Agree. So these are the two things that we have to decide. Everything else yes. will be done by the algorithm. Okay, but two things that we have to decide are these. First is number of neighbors. Second is distance form. Yes. Fine. Okay. Now 
let's move forward so how to choose this so pranav can i call these two things first number of neighbors second distance formula can i call these model settings mm, yes model settings okay in order to find the correct value for your model algorithm settings okay is there a way there are ways there are techniques but remember none of them are full proof none of the techniques are full proof guys okay so let me uh, ask another uh, person a question let me ask another person a question over here let me ask it to a new student let me ask it to binesh is binesh there binesh yeah yes you are there ah yes okay let, let me unmute your mic binesh okay binesh i have unmuted your mic and binesh just a general question i am asking apart from machine learning okay just a general question let's say you are switching on the tv okay you are switching on the tv and you want to adjust the uh, volume setting okay in tv there is a volume setting right so uh, what is the approach that you will use to adjust the volume setting binesh you can unmute your mic i have allowed you access to it If there is any issue, uh, you are not able to unmute the light. No, I have given you access. Yeah, I just wait one second. Let me open up the chat. I guess I have received some message. That's all. Fine. So Binesh has mentioned over here that okay, he will use a remote to do that uh, volume setting. Okay. Or uh, if possible, I want to, to take help of student who can unmute their mic. So let me do this one thing. let me uh unmute let's say uh pragnya's mic okay let me do that so pragnya i will need your help over here yes yes so pragnya now fine uh, you have a tv a new tv that is a new tv see if it was your uh, a tv that you are already using you know what is the correct volume to set for it okay you already know that in your mind but let's say yes. it's a new tv Okay, the one that you have just bought. Now yes. you have just switched it on. What is the approach that you will find to uh, arrive at the correct volume setting? Uh, I'll move to some distance and check. I'll increase the volume and find that whether up to that distance I am able to hear or not. Okay, fine. So can I say at first, just when you switch on the TV, let's say the TV volume setting is from zero to one hundred. Can I say what I do, Pragna? Is what I do is I first of all. Whenever I uh, turn the TV on, na, I set it to a moderate value, something like fifty, okay. And then what I do is I try to decrease the volume and see how it is working. And then above fifty, I try to increase the volume and see how it is working. Uh, yes, that is also one option to do. That is also one option. Correct. So, for example, I arrived at this number fifty. I thought fifty is a moderate value. Why? Because I am experienced. i know that 50 is neither low nor high right yes okay uh, on the other hand pragna if somebody had started to uh, work with the volume from let's say a number like let's suppose i am erasing this let's say you have a, a two month a two month old child two month old child who is very beginner okay he was a beginner in the world let's say is a two month old a two month old child what he would do is let's say he might set the volume at first to somewhere like 100 and then he will try to uh, decrease or increase whatever he wants to do but can i say if i set it to 100 at first it will not be a ideal approach na because if they yes. set, set the volume to 100 it will be too loud for me yes yes everyone in my home will uh, scold me that what am i doing uh, why is this set why have i set the volume to 100 it's too loud okay so You work with uh, Pragna that okay. If I am starting off, I should start with some moderate value like fifty, and then I should decrease or increase. I should do that your know, volume tuning. So I arrived at this value fifty based on my experience. Whereas yes. a two month or two month old child would not uh, have that experience, so you would not know which volume to start. Now coming back to machine learning. in machine learning pragna in this first machine learning model algorithm that we are studying the name of that algorithm is k nearest neighbors what are the two settings that you have to decide 
um if it is uh, how many dots are there the half dot i can take it uh, from the from the unlabeled uh, um, item to the labeled item i'll take the minimum uh, like uh, um, how many art means it total is 10 is there i can take nearest five and calculate on top of that okay so you are saying whether to take five number of neighbors or whether to take three number of neighbors or yes. whether to take nine number of neighbors that is something that we have to decide correct okay yes. so first is choosing number of neighbors what is the second thing pragna that we will have to decide second setting if you remember okay. pragna hmm. uh so maximum i can take as a co if this calculation maximum i can take as a 2 and minimum i can take as a 2 and maximum i can take as a 3 okay so number of neighbors you are selecting is yes, that is one thing uh, that uh, you mentioned correct second thing pragna second next can i say based on number of neighbors i select that many closest labeled points so if i have chosen number of neighbors equal to 3 I will choose three closest labeled points with respect to my unlabeled data point. Correct? Yes. So how do I know which labeled point is closer, which labeled point is far away? By calculating distance. And there uh, are many distance the, formulas. Yeah. Uh, the distance formula. Correct. So the second setting, Pragna, that we as a user, we as a machine learning engineer, have to figure out is choosing the correct distance formula. first setting is choosing the correct number of neighbors second setting is choosing the correct distance formula okay and let me put this note uh, prabhya over here that in order to choose this correct setting or in order to choose the correct i mean uh, this setting in uh, model terms in machine learning terms it's also known as parameter okay so remember that a model setting is also known as a model parameter okay so in order to find out the correct setting Uh, value or in order to find out the correct parameter value we have this technique called hyper parameter tuning okay the name of that technique that helps to find the correct value for the parameter or the name of that technique that helps to find the correct value for a setting is known as hyper parameter tuning okay there are many different methods of hyper parameter tuning first is called grid search approach second method of hyperparameter tuning is called random search approach third method of hyperparameter there are there are many other methods out there okay many other methods okay there are many many methods of hyperparameter tuning but remember pragna and other students that this hyperparameter tuning yes it helps us to find the correct value for a setting or it helps us to find correct value for a parameter but is it a full proof approach no it is not a full proof approach guys full proof that means will it always give me the best value for a setting not necessary so it's not full proof so there is uh, so the question is how to know which value i mean how, how do i arrive at the correct value there is a technique called hyperparameter tuning but it is not necessary that it will always give you the correct value so that this is a, a thing that we are struggling with in the machine learning industry right now okay Uh, that currently there is no technique that is a full proof way of arriving at the best setting value or arriving at the best parameter value okay yes we have this technique called hyperparameter tuning but it is not full proof when i will show you the working of hyperparameter tuning you yourself will know uh, the issues with it okay you yourself will know the issues with it so don't worry okay fine so just to ask uh, pragna uh pragna in order to find out the model settings so for example in knn there were two model settings first was choosing correct number of neighbors second was choosing correct distance formula pragna in order to find out model settings correct value for these model settings uh these settings are also known as what pragna uh, parameters parameters perfect now pragna in order to find out the correct value for the setting or in order to find out the correct value for these parameters we have a technique called hyperparameter tuning tuning perfect it helps us to it helps you to find a good value for the setting good value for the parameter but is it necessary that it will always lead you to the best value 
uh, no it won't give that full proof no it's it's it is not full proof so this is a thing that we are st struggling right now in the machine learning industry and because of this guys there are many problems in the machine learning industry that we have still not been able to solve for example pragna have you seen anyone who has built a machine learning model that gives you the accurate prediction for stock price has anyone made no. such a model no just we no. are going for the uh, average of that so if it is train is up to 60 or 70 then we are saying that okay the it is working correct so you are you are saying that currently nobody has made a full proof model that predicts the stock price currently uh, correctly if suppose someone had that model let's say i had had built that model next week i would have become ambani right because i would know that okay at which date what will be the stock price i would have been able to manipulate it and all of that fine so there are still some things that we are not able to do in the machine learning industry because of what because of hyper parameter tuning that hyper parameter tuning is not full proof okay currently we have not found any method of hyper parameter tuning that will lead you to the best uh, value for the model setting so it uh, completely depends on experience guys okay it completely depends on experience uh, so again i remember hyper uh, so re remember this guys that hyper parameter tuning is not full proof okay uh, so in order to arrive at the correct value for the model setting uh, you have to rely on your experience you might remember that okay on the previous data i used this type of setting this value of setting it worked on that data and this data looks similar to the previous data that i worked with so let me use the similar setting value okay so remember uh, that hyper parameter tuning mostly depends on your experience but fine let me show to you how it works okay i'll show to you how it works remember it is not full proof in the working itself you will realize it is not full proof so let me show you the different methods of hyper parameter tuning first this grid search hyper parameter tuning let me show you how it works so i'll go ahead and show to you how it works Okay, let me show you grid search hyperparameter tuning. Grid search hyperparameter tuning. Let me show you the working. So, what are the steps? Let me go ahead and let me write down these steps over here of grid search hyperparameter tuning. The first step is to shortlist the setting values or to shortlist the parameter values based on your experience. Then the second step of grid search hyperparameter tuning is to create models on each possibility of setting values. Okay, uh, so let's say we have a setting called uh, number of neighbors, which is one of the algorithm settings of KNN. So let's say I've shortlisted some values like three, five, seven. So you will create a model with number of neighbors equal to three. You will create a model with number of neighbors equal to five. You will create a model with number of neighbors equal to seven. Okay, that's what you will do in the second step. Third step is you will see which model worked well, whether the model with number of neighbors equal to three worked well, whether the model with number of neighbors equal to five worked well, or whether the model with number of neighbors equal to seven worked well. Okay. So uh, select the model giving the best performance. OK, uh, so based on the accuracy, select the model giving the best performance. Then fourth is to uh, select the model settings use in the best model okay so let's say i have created three models one with number of neighbors equal to three one with number of neighbors equal to five one with number of neighbors equal to seven let's say the model with number of neighbors equal to five worked well comparatively so i will say that okay number of neighbors equal to five is a good model setting okay so select the model setting that is used in your best model okay so let me show you how it works so as i mentioned first step is what uh, your pragna first step is to shortlist the setting values based on your experience or in other words shortlist the parameter values based on your experience in knn there are two settings that you have to decide first is number of neighbors second is distance formula so pragna uh, 
based on your limited experience can you tell me the uh, can you shortlist some values for number of neighbors can you give some shortlisted values to me uh, regarding the uh, pv or it is the table uh, no uh, just in general uh, uh, on the data what do you think let's suppose you have some imaginary data on that imaginary data as per you give me some number of neighbors value that you want me to shortlist 40 40 okay then give me 40. some more uh, 40 80 84 85 okay. fine so over here let's suppose you have selected these values over here 40 80 84 now similarly pragna for distance formulas can you shortlist some of the distance formulas uh, which was uh, no no distance formula so we I um, talked to you uh, about the x x minus y x x minus y is the uh, whole square. Correct. So I thought uh, uh, explain to you about uh, explain to you about three different distance formulas. First was Euclidean, second was uh, Manhattan, third was Minkowski, right? First Euclidean, second yeah. Manhattan, third Minkowski. Here it is. So out of these three, which ones do you like? Tell me and shortlist those. Euclidean. Euclidean and sorry, what did you say? And, uh, and uh, second one Manhattan. Okay, fine. So you want to shortlist these two, Euclidean and Manhattan. So what I will do is I'll go ahead and I will select it, Euclidean and Manhattan. Euclidean and Manhattan. Okay. Fine. And uh, I have selected, you have uh, selected these, you have shortlisted these model setting values. And fine, based on that, let's go ahead. And when you do that, Pragna, can you see on your screen, have we created a grid like structure or a table like structure? Pardon, I, uh, can you please repeat again? Ah, yes. Uh, so based on the values that you gave to me, right? You gave me some shortlisted values on your own. Yes. Yeah. Based on that, can you see uh, on in the uh, I've drawn it in blue. Do you see a grid like structure or a table like structure? It is a grid like structure. Yes, right. It's a grid like structure over here. Yes. The diagram that you see. That's how the name came into existence. Grid search hyperparameter tuning. That's why the name was given to it. Grid search hyperparameter tuning. Because you see, like you, you see this grid like structure or a table like structure. Okay, fine. Okay. Next step. Next step now. Next step is to do what? Create models on each possibility of setting values. Okay. So we'll create a model. We'll create a model over here with, uh, let's say, number of neighbors equal to 40 and distance formula equal to Euclidean. Then we'll create a model with number of neighbors equal to 40 and distance formula equal to Manhattan. Like this, Pragna, how many different models can I create? Six, six, six right? Perfect, six models. So we are, I'll create six total models. So first model is done, second model is done. Let me create a third model uh, with number of neighbors equal to 80 and distance formula equal to Euclidean. Let's say I create a fourth model with number of neighbors equal to 80 and distance formula equal to Manhattan. Similarly, I'll create a fifth model with number of neighbors equal to 84 and distance formula equal to Euclidean. Then I'll create a sixth and my last model with number of neighbors equal to 84 and distance formula equal to Manhattan. Now I will see which model is performing well. So each model will give me some, perf uh, uh, some performance. Okay, we, we will try to test the model and see how that model is performing. So we'll see the accuracy of the model's predictions. Okay, how to do that, all of that I'll explain to you in detail, don't worry. But let's suppose you are calculating the accuracy of model's predictions. So let's say model one was 90% accurate, model two was 60% accurate, model three was, let's suppose 92% accurate, model four was, let's say 32% accurate, 
model 5 was 88 percent accurate and model 6 was let's say 70 percent accurate fine so as per the step of grid search hyperparameter tuning you need to select the model giving the best performance so now you tell me paragnya which model is giving you the highest accuracy the best performance uh, 90 percent the model one okay uh, sorry okay. model three three right this one is giving you the best performance fine so the next step as per grid search hyperparameter tuning is to select the model settings used is the is used in the best model so in your best model what was the setting values for number of neighbor what was 80. the setting value 80 80 for, right for distance formula what was the setting value euclidean euclidean so this is how you find out that okay number of neighbors equal to 80 and distance formula equal to euclidean is a good model setting you can go ahead and create a model with, with these settings. But this process of finding the uh, model setting, the appropriate model setting value, okay, uh, is it foolproof? You tell me based on the working. No. No, right? Because see, what yes. if you had shortlisted some other values over here? Then what would have happened? Then it the be entire, bad Correct, the entire result would have varied. Okay, so this is not foolproof. So it uh, uh, a lot of it depends on your experience. Okay, so as I declared earlier, that hyperparameter tuning is not foolproof. Uh, a lot of it depends on your experience. And as I mentioned, there are different approaches of hyperparameter tuning. I already showed you one grid search approach. Okay, uh, fine. Now I I need uh, just one last question. I will ask you, Pragna, and then I'll let you go. So Pragna, the question is. In this grid search approach, fine, I had to create six models, okay, because you had shortlisted less number of model settings, because of which I was able to create six models. Is there a possibility, Pragna, that I still, I shortlist more and more values for my model settings, and because of that, I will have to create more and more models? Yes. Yes. Suppose what if you shortlist many, many values, let's say for those many, many values, you have to create models, and let's say you have to create 100 such models. Unnecessary time yes. will be wasted to create 100 models, correct? Yes. Okay. Instead of that, okay, uh, instead of uh, wasting our time in, uh, in order to create those multiple models, we can prefer this approach of hyperparameter tuning called random search. In random search, what happens is, let me explain that to you. Okay. In random search, what happens is, instead of focusing on all the setting values, okay, in random search, what happens is instead of focusing on all the setting values, you only randomly focus on a few setting values. So let's say out of the shortlisted values, the algorithm might select these two. Okay, out of the shortlisted distance formula values, let's say the algorithm might select this one. So now you tell me, Pragnya, I have randomly selected some shortlisted values. Now, can I say, Pragnya, that only two models will be created? Yes. yes, because I have randomly uh, selected uh, the values from the shortlisted values that you gave to me. I randomly selected some setting values. Only on those selected setting values I'll work. So my first model will be created with number of neighbors equal to 40 and distance formula equal to Euclidean. Then the next uh, one will be done with number of neighbors equal to 84, distance formula equal to Euclidean and so on. So your, uh, this is random search hyperparameter theory where you do not focus on all the shortlisted values to create models. Uh, uh, the machine will randomly select uh, some values out of the total shortlisted values that you have given. The machine will randomly select which shortlisted values to work from. Okay, it will randomly select. Okay, and only on those randomly selected values will build the model. So with this, what happens is we'll be working on less number of models as compared to grid search. So time will be saved. But what is the disadvantage? That this is an even worse approach than grid search. In grid search, at least uh, you had some confidence that okay, at the end you might arrive at a good setting value. The random search is even worse than that. Okay, so yes, it is saving time, but as far as its performance is concerned, it's even worse. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Fine. Uh, so now let's go ahead. Uh, Jaikesh's Manhattan distance is used by Uber. Uh, so Jaikesh, uh, 
if i were to assume i would assume that but uh, they have not made it uh, see it's the proprietary algorithm na so they do not make it public which distance formula is used okay so in the blogs anywhere on the internet you might only see speculations okay you might only see speculations but they do not make it public as to which distance formula that they are using okay because it's a proprietary algorithm okay. they do not make it public uh, so in any blog anywhere you see such a information is only speculation out there okay fine all right so let's go ahead so uh just to recap uh, and i will need help of one student to recap over here so let me take help of jaykesh so over here Uh, or let me take help of I, I guess jaykesh had some mic issues if i'm not wrong no i guess jaykesh did not have some other student had mic issues okay so let me do one thing let me give mic access to jaykesh and jaykesh i'll need your little help to revise i have uh, given you the mic access oh uh, yes yes so jaykesh let us just revise from starting okay from starting so jaykesh from starting we'll do a quick revision So, Jai K, my first question to you is, what is machine learning? Uh, it's a calculation method. Uh, the the okay. feature and target should be there, like uh, in a uh, tabular format, and there should be the feature and target uh, to do this activity. okay correct that is something that we had seen at yes but if anybody tells you the definition of machine learning let's say in an interview if anybody asks you definition of machine learning what you will say so recommendation uh, which uh, now uh, the categorize the which uh, people like do not like so uh, on basis of that it's recommend the thing or predict the thing correct so as you mentioned machine learning is a set of tools that is used for two purposes first is to obtain inferences from data second is to obtain predictions from data now jk how do we obtain inferences and predictions from data we do that by using something called a machine learning model what is a machine learning model it is a statistical representation of a real world process so just to understand it and uh, understand this sentence again i am taking uh, one example again for you guys so suppose if we have some housing related data in which i have information about the area of the house in square feet and i have information about the price of the house so let's say the first house that i surveyed had a area of 100 square feet price of the house was 1 crore second house that i surveyed had a area of 200 square feet the price of the house was 2 crore the third house that i surveyed had a area of 300 square feet and the price of the house was 3 crore so jaykesh i have a question for you if at all i have information about the fourth house whose area is 400 square feet but i don't know the price of this house so can you predict the price of this fourth house over here according to you uh, yes by calculation of uh, previous one ha uh, so and what will it be what will be that prediction 4 crore 4 crore so can i say you arrived at this prediction jaykesh using some mathematics in your head correct that's exactly what a machine learning model will do a machine learning model will also try to simulate what would happen in the real world by using statistics or by using mathematics okay there are two notes to remember before making any machine learning model first note is that in order for any machine learning model to work we need some data to work with and that data needs to have some rows and some columns second important note to remember is that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column feature columns are those columns that help me to predict target column is that column that i want to predict so let's say if i want to predict price column then price will be called my target column and since square feet and city help me to predict price then they will be called my feature columns okay now there are different types of machine learning models so jaykesh do we have only two types of machine learning models or do we have more than two in the market so there is uh, there is more than two but uh, here we are focusing on this uh, two only perfect there are more than two and remember after every few months a new type comes into the market but majority of the work 95% of the work done in the machine learning industry is done on these two types only so we are focusing on these two types first type that will be focusing on is supervised learning model second type that will be focusing on is unsupervised learning model 
Jayakesh, what is the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning model? Uh, here it is a super uh, learning model have uh, features and target both, right? Feature and target both, and here only the target. Uh, in unsupervised learning model, you only have features. Feature you do feature. not have target. Okay, perfect. Then, buddy, in supervised learning model, we have two types. First is classification, second is regression. So, what is the difference between the two, Jaikish? A classification model is a category uh, related we are doing. Correct. And a regression model is a, a basis of some calculation. Okay, so we can say that in a classification model in the data that I'm using in that data, the target column has finite set of possibilities. Whereas in a regression model, the data that I'm using in that data, my target column has infinite set of possibilities. With this, Jaikesh, is the basics of machine learning clear to you, buddy? This is just yes. a quick revision that we did. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is the quick revision. So let me now take help of another student. Let me take help of... Anyone who can help me, anyone, uh, any new student who can help me to do this revision. Uh, so after basics of machine learning, we tried to look into our first machine learning model algorithm called KNN. Anybody who can help me to revise KNN, just mention it in the chat. I would like to unmute your mic. Okay, even if you are wrong, wrong not an issue. Okay. Even if you are wrong, not an issue. I just need help of someone. Anyone can volunteer? Mohammed, Mohammed, can you help me, buddy, to revise? Is Mohammed there? Maybe Mohammed is not there in front of the screen. Fine. Uh, I just wanted some help of one student who can help me to revise. But okay, not an issue, if at all. Uh, you are shy, you don't, uh, uh, you have forgotten uh, uh, the working of our first machine learning model algorithm, not an issue. I'll explain that to you again. Uh, Parag says, no, Parag, depending on the use case, you will have to select one type of model, depending on the use case. So it depends upon your use case, what task you want to perform. Okay. Going forward, Parag, uh, I will show you the implementation of all these machine learning models. At that time, you will understand. So by the end of the session, you will get an answer to your question. Okay, but to answer your question in short, you have to select one type depending on your use case. Okay, you have to select one type. It's like asking, can I use a, a car and a, a, a plane both together? Well, no, depending on your use case, if you want to have a certain use case, you will use a plane. In a different use case, you will use a car. Okay, so there are, these are two different things, just like a car and plane are two different things. Can you use them together? No. Depending on the use case, you have to select one of your choice. So similarly, depending on your use case, you have to select either supervised learning model or unsupervised learning model. And by the end of this session, you will get an answer to your question once we focus on implementation. Up till now, I'm just showing you the theory. Okay. And Parag, can you please help me to revise one thing, buddy? I just need your help to revise this working of an algorithm called KNN. Okay. So I'll try to unmute your mic. If possible, please help me out. Okay. So Parag, uh, now one second. Let me open up this slide over here. For some reason, uh, okay, uh, I'm able to click. Fine, let's go ahead. So, uh, Parag, let's see the steps of KNN. Okay, first of all, I've just plotted the, this data that I had with me on a graph. In this data, Parag, you tell me how many labeled points did I have? How many labeled points okay. did I have, Parag? Four labeled points. Correct, four labeled points uh, representing four labeled rows. Perfect. And Parag, how many unlabeled points did I have? Uh, one. One. One unlabeled point representing one unlabeled. Perfect. Now, let's see the steps of our first machine learning model algorithm called KNN. So there are four steps, buddy. What is the first one? 
Uh, the first one was we were defining the value of n or the value, number of closest neighbors we wanted to choose. So I don't remember the exact term Perfect. it's called, but yeah. Perfect. That's the first step. Correct. First step is to choose number of neighbors. So let's say just as an example, we chose number of neighbors equal to three. Fine. So we did this. Now, second step, Parag. Uh, second step uh, was to calculate the distance or uh, select the formula for the distance. Uh, Correct. Correct. So second step was the, depending on the number of neighbors, you will select that many closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. Right. And as you said, how do we know which label point is closer or far away? As you mentioned, by choosing some distance yeah. formula. Correct. So second step was depending on number of neighbors, we'll select that many closest labeled points with respect to my unlabeled data. Point. So this was my unlabeled data point over here, the one that I've circled. And since I selected three uh, number of neighbors, that's why I will have three closest labeled data points. Okay, that's why I will have three okay. closest labeled data points. So your, yeah. uh, I chose three closest labeled data points. Second step done with your help. Now, Parag, I will need your help for the third step. What is the third step? Uh, not sure. I believe that's. Uh, I'm still not clear if you have already calculated the distance. If not, then. Ha, we have calculated the distance because of which we knew that, okay, these three labeled points were closer. So we selected them based okay. on their distance. So distance work is done okay. now. Okay. So third step, but if you remember, it was to do voting. Right? So all of these selected label points will vote. So since we have selected okay. three label points, right, uh, they will vote. So now you tell me, Parag, uh, as you know, uh, red points will vote for red, blue points will vote for blue. So how many right. votes will go to red and how many votes will go to blue? So uh, two is to one, two for red, uh, one for blue. Perfect. Two votes will go to red, one vote will go to blue. So with your help, we'll cover three steps already. Now fourth and last step, just fourth and last step left. What is it, Parag? Fourth and last step. No. Okay, no issues. Uh, let me revise it for you. So guys, fourth and last step is, depending on majority of the votes, we will assign a label to the unlabeled data point. So here, Parag, majority of the votes have gone to which color, red or blue? Red. 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 Yeah. So that means the unlabeled data point in the middle will be labeled as red. And just one last question to you, Parag. Red color stands for which target value? Uh, male. In male in our data red color stands for male target value that means i'm predicting that for this row for this unlabeled row the label predicted will be equal to male and that's exactly what you will see in this slide over here. like this we can predict for any number of rows okay so with help of uh, jaykesh we uh, revised machine learning basics and with help of parag we revised the working of our first machine learning model algorithm called knn so guys, are these two things clear? Machine learning basics and working of our first machine learning model algorithm, KNN. Are these two things clear, guys? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So uh, fine. Although uh, we wasted some time in revision, but that's fine because I understand this is your first day. So you might not remember all of the things. That's why I did a quick revision. Okay, fine. Now, uh, what we'll do is, since it's almost uh, uh, one, okay, let me ask one more question before we uh, before we take a lunch break. Uh, one more question. Uh, so, in every model algorithm, whether it is KNN or some other algorithm, there will be some model settings. For example, in KNN, there were two settings. First was number of neighbors. Second was finding out the correct distance formula, right? First was finding out the correct number of neighbors. Second was finding out correct distance formula. How to do that? How to find out the correct settings? Is the, do we have a technique for it? What is the name of that technique? Can anyone mention it in the chat? What is the technique that will help me to find the correct model settings? Whether it is for KNN algorithm or any algorithm going forward. What is the name of that technique? As Binesh says, hyperparameter tuning. And is hyperparameter tuning a foolproof approach, guys? Is it a foolproof approach? 
I mean, the, is there a guarantee that it will always lead you to the correct value for the setting or the best value for the setting, I should say? No, it's not foolproof. So that is why Pranav mentioned that it depends a lot on your experience. Okay, uh, fine. And I showed you the working of hyperparameter tuning and in the working, uh, you might have noted that it depends a lot on your experience as Pranav has mentioned in the chat. Okay, so what we'll do is we have understood the theory of KNN. We have understood the theory of KNN. Now it's time to implement it with code. Implement it with code. Okay, and that implementation we'll see after the lunch break. So let's take a one hour lunch break. So from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. we'll take our lunch break. After that we'll be back and we'll see the implementation. Okay, fine. So we'll take a one hour lunch break up till 2 p.m. And we'll see the implementation of the uh, KNN algorithm. We have already seen the theory of that KNN algorithm. Uh, after the lunch break, we'll see its implementation. So let's take a one hour lunch break, guys, and then we'll be back. Okay, so I've set the clock and we'll be back in one hour. So uh, uh, right at 2 p.m., we'll be resuming our lecture. Okay, till then, I'll just be on mute. Okay, and after 2 p.m., we'll be back. 